After completing this course, you should be able to explain why understanding yourself is essential for being a good manager and describe methods for enhancing self-awareness. Having insight into why people behave the way they do is part of good management. People bring their individual differences to work each day, and these differences influence how they interpret assignments, whether they like to be told what to do, how they handle challenges, and how they interact with others. By increasing their understanding of individual differences, managers can learn how to get the best out of each employee and more effectively lead people through workplace challenges. However, the first requirement for being a good manager is understanding oneself. Managers' characteristics and behavior can profoundly affect the workplace and influence employee motivation, morale, and job performance. Self-awareness means being conscious of the internal aspects of one's nature, such as personality traits, beliefs, emotions, attitudes, and perceptions, and appreciating how your patterns affect other people. A recent survey revealed the nearly unanimous answer to the question about the most important capability for leaders to develop is self-awareness. Most management experts agree that a primary characteristic of effective leaders is that they know who they are and what they stand for. When managers deeply understand themselves, they remain grounded and constant. People know what to expect from them. There are a number of ways that people can increase their understanding of themselves. Two important approaches to self-awareness are soliciting feedback from others and using self-assessments. Just as we use a mirror in the mornings to shave or fix our hair, we can use other people as a mirror to see ourselves more clearly. A manager might consider himself to be patient and understanding, but his employees might see him as easily irritated and unsympathetic. We all have blind spots, an attitude about a person that he or she is not aware of or doesn't recognize as a problem. This limits our effectiveness and hinders career success. Seeking feedback to enhance self-awareness can improve performance and job satisfaction for both managers and employees. We all have illusions about ourselves, so we need help from others to get a clear picture of who we are. Another highly valuable way to increase self-awareness is through self-assessment, which uses self-inquiry and reflection to gain insights into oneself from the results of scores on self-assessment instruments. By completing these assessments as honestly as possible, you can analyze your scores and increase your understanding of various aspects of yourself. Self-assessment also means regularly reflecting on our thoughts and feelings. Introspection, reflecting on our experiences, examining the effects of our actions and behavior, looking at the consequences for ourselves and others, and asking, what can I learn, is a valuable use of time that too many managers overlook. Some people keep a journal, meditate, or just sit quietly and think through their day. Remember, a manager who understands him or herself is better able to understand and interact effectively with others. Two important elements of happy and productive employees are job satisfaction and trust. Job satisfaction reflects the degree to which a person finds fulfillment in his or her job. In general, people experience job satisfaction when their work matches their needs and interests, when working conditions and rewards such as pay are satisfactory, and when they like their coworkers and they have a positive relationship with their supervisor. Managers create the environment that determines whether employees have positive or negative feelings towards their jobs. People with a manager who created a clear and inspiring vision were 70% more satisfied with their jobs and 100% more likely to stay with the organization. Those who felt they were treated with respect were 55% more satisfied and engaged and 110% more likely to stay with the organization. Employee engagement relates to the level of an employee's commitment and connection to an organization. To me, employee engagement simply means employees are loyal and productive. Employees know what to do and want to do it. High levels of engagement promote attraction, retention, motivation, foster loyalty, and improve organizational performance and value. Most executives already understand that employee engagement directly affects the organization's financial health and profitability. 
So although concepts of employee engagement and job satisfaction are somewhat interrelated, they are not synonymous. Satisfaction has more to do with whether the employee is personally happy than with whether the employee is actively involved in advancing organizational goals. Satisfaction is about employees being happy with their job or organization, while engagement is about an employee being actively interested in their work and the value it adds to the organization. Satisfaction is a broad, attitudinal outcome like organizational loyalty or pride. It's hard to act on, and some facets of satisfaction are irrelevant to performance. Engagement, on the other hand, predicts satisfaction, as well as many other concrete organizational outcomes. Trust is a firm belief in the reliability, truth, ability, or strength of something or someone. Considering how important trust is in any relationship, it's surprising how little attention many managers devote to building and maintaining trust in the workplace. Trust can make all the difference between an employee who's emotionally committed to the organization and one who's not. Organizational commitment refers to an employee's loyalty and engagement with the organization. An employee with a high degree of organizational commitment is likely to say we when talking about the company. Such a person likes being part of the organization and tries to contribute to its success. Sadly, the most recent Gallup Workforce Survey found that 68.5% of employees in the United States were disengaged, with the highest level of disengagement among younger employees. Other surveys suggest that commitment and engagement levels around the world are also relatively low. Trust in management is an essential component for success in today's chaotic environment. Managers promote trust by being open and honest in their business dealings, keeping employees informed, giving them a say in decisions, providing the necessary training and other resources that enable them to succeed, treating them fairly, and offering rewards that they value. An individual's personality is the set of characteristics that underline a relatively stable pattern of behavior in response to ideas, objects, or people in the environment. In common use, people think of personality in terms of traits, the fairly consistent characteristics a person exhibits. Researchers investigated whether any traits stand up to scientific scrutiny. Although investigators examined thousands of traits over the years, their findings fit into five general dimensions that describe personality. These dimensions are often called the Big Five Personality Factors. The Big Five personality factors describe an individual's extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, emotional stability, and openness to experience. Extroversion is the degree to which a person is outgoing, sociable, assertive, and comfortable with interpersonal relationships. Agreeableness is the degree to which a person is able to get along with others by being good-natured, likable, cooperative, forgiving, understanding, and trusting. Being conscientious, or conscientiousness, is the degree to which a person is focused on a few goals, thus behaving in ways that are responsible, dependable, persistent, and achievement-oriented. Emotional factors, or emotional stability, is the degree to which a person is calm, enthusiastic, self-confident, rather than tense, depressed, moody, or insecure. And finally, openness to experience is the degree to which a person has a broad range of interests and is imaginative, creative, artistically sensitive, and willing to consider new ideas. These big five personality factors represent on a continuum. That is, a person may have low, moderate, or a high degree of each quality. Having a moderate to high degree of each of the big five personality factors is considered desirable for a wide range of employees, but it isn't always a key to success. An individual's personality will shape his or hers work-related attitudes and behaviors. As a manager, you will have people with a wide variety of personality characteristics. Although the term is somewhat difficult to define in a precise way, an emotion can be thought of as a mental state that arises spontaneously within a person based on an interaction with the environment rather than through conscious effort and is often accompanied by psychological changes or sensations. People can experience a wide range of emotions at work, such as happiness, anger, fear, or relief, and these affect their workplace attitudes and behaviors. 
Researchers have been attempting to understand emotions for thousands of years, and scientific debate continues about how to categorize emotions. One model that's useful for managers distinguishes the major positive and negative emotions. Negative emotions are sparked when a person becomes frustrated in trying to achieve his or her goals, while positive emotions are triggered when people are on track towards achieving goals. Positive emotions include happiness, pride, affection, and relief. While negative emotions include anger, anxiety, guilt, sadness, envy, and disgust. Thus, emotions can be understood by being determined by whether people are getting their needs and goals met. An employee who fails to get a pay raise or is reprimanded by a supervisor would likely experience negative emotions such as sadness, anger, or anxiety. Whereas a person who gets a promotion would experience feelings of pride and happiness. Managers can influence whether people experience primary positive or negative emotions at work. For one thing, the emotional state of the manager influences the entire team or department. Most of us realize that we can catch emotions from others. Emotional cognition is the tendency for people to absorb and express the emotions, moods, and attitudes of those around them. If we're around someone who's happy and enthusiastic, those positive emotions rub off on us. On the other hand, someone who's sad and angry can bring us down. Managers who express positive emotions such as happiness, enthusiasm, and appreciation trigger positive emotions and behaviors in employees. Research suggests that nearly all human beings will automatically and unconsciously start feeling and displaying the same emotions as those around them. Good managers pay attention to people's emotions because positive emotions are typically linked to higher productivity and greater effectiveness. A Gallup Management Journal survey found that managers, especially frontline supervisors, have a lot to do with whether employees have positive or negative emotions associated with their work lives. In recent years, research in the area of emotional intelligence has shown that managers who are in touch with their own feelings and the feelings of others can enhance employee and organizational performance. Emotional intelligence includes four basic components. First, self-awareness. Second, self-management. Third, social awareness. And fourth, relationship management. Let's take a look at each. Being aware of what you're feeling is the basis for all other components of emotional intelligence. People who are in touch with their feelings are better able to guide their own lives and actions. A high degree of self-awareness means that you can accurately assess your own strengths and limitations and have a healthy sense of self-confidence. The ability to control disruptive or harmful emotions and balance one's moods so that worry, anxiety, fear, and anger do not cloud thinking and get in the way of what needs to be done. People who are skilled in self-management remain optimistic and hopeful despite setbacks and obstacles. This ability is critical for pursuing long-term goals. The ability to understand others and practice empathy, which means being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes to recognize what others are feeling without them needing to tell you. People with social awareness are capable of understanding divergent points and interacting effectively with many different types of people. The ability to connect with others, build positive relationships, respond to the emotions of others, and influence others is all about relationship management. People with relationship management skills know how to listen and communicate clearly and treat others with compassion and respect. Studies show a positive relationship between job performance and a high emotional intelligent quotient, or EQ, in a variety of jobs. Self-management is the ability to engage in self-regulating thoughts and behavior to accomplish all of your tasks and handle difficult or challenging situations. Three basic principles define how to manage your many big and small commitments effectively so you can get them accomplished. These three self-management principles are clarity of mind, clarity of objectives, and an organized system. The first principle is that, if you're carrying too much around in your head, your mind can't be clear. If your mind isn't clear, you can't focus, and if you can't focus, you can't get anything done. Thus, anything you considered unfinished business needs to be placed in some kind of trusted system outside your head. Next, you have to be clear about exactly what you need to do and decide the steps towards accomplishing it. Finally, once you've decided the actions that you need to take, you need to keep reminders in a well-organized system. 
By building a self-management approach based on these three principles, clarity of mind, clarity of objectives, and a system of organized reminders, you can get unstuck and make measurable progress towards achieving all of the things that you need to do. Many people don't realize that they waste at least an hour of a typical workday simply because they're disorganized. You can gain better control of your life and the many things that you have to do by mastering some simple but powerful steps. The five steps for managing your time include empty your head, decide on your next action, get organized, perform a weekly review, and now do it. In order to clear your mind, you have to see the many things weighing on it. The first step, therefore, is to write down on separate pieces of paper all of the activities, duties, tasks, or commitments that are demanding part of your attention. The idea is to get everything out of your head and down on paper. To organize all of this stuff, combine similar items into buckets. Remember to keep the number of buckets to a minimum, otherwise you'll feel scattered and overwhelmed. For each item in your buckets, decide the real, specific, physical action that you need to take. Then, you have three options to determine priorities. Do it, where you follow the two-minute rule. If it's something that can be done in less than two minutes, do it now. Delegate it, where you ask yourself if you're the right person to handle the task. If something can be done as well by someone else, delegate it. And finally, defer it. If something will take longer than two minutes, but cannot be delegated to someone else, you'll have to defer it. The third step is to organize all the items you've deferred. At this stage, schedule any appointments that you've identified as next actions and record them on whatever calendar you check daily. You can assign yourself a definite date in the future to perform certain tasks. For all other items, keep a list of next actions, either on paper or your mobile device of choice. Once a week, review and complete your next actions list and your calendar for the coming week. Scan the entire list of outstanding projects and actions needed so that you can make efficient choices about your time. This weekly review is critical because it keeps your mind from taking back the job of trying to hold and remember everything. This weekly review is also the time to put your house in order by collecting, processing, and organizing new items. Once you've collected, processed, and organized, and reviewed your current commitments, you'll have a better sense of what needs to be done, which will enable you to make better choices about how to use your time. Your intuition and understanding of yourself can help decide what to do when. In summary, self-management is a critical part of the success of managers. A manager's ability to engage in self-regulating thoughts and behaviors helps accomplish tasks and handle difficult or challenging situations. Formally defined, stress is an individual's physiological and emotional response to external stimuli that place physical or psychological demands on the individual and create uncertainty and lack of personal control where important outcomes are at stake. These stimuli, called stressors, produce some combination of frustration, the inability to achieve a goal, such as the inability to meet a deadline because of inadequate resources, and anxiety, such as the fear of being displaced or not meeting deadlines. Stress levels have gone up in many organizations in recent years. The number of employees who are irritable, insulting, or discourteous has grown, as people are coping with stress of job uncertainty, overwhelming debt, tighter access to credit, and increased workload due to downsizing. In one survey, nearly half of U.S. workers reported experiencing yelling and verbal abuse on the job, and another study found that 2 to 3 percent of people admit to pushing, slapping, or hitting someone at work. But stress isn't always negative. Without a certain amount of stress, we would be complacent and accomplish little. A certain level of stress challenges you to increase your focus, alertness, efficiency, and productivity. At that point, however, things go downhill quickly, and stress compromises your job performance and relationships, even your health. In the United States, an estimated 1 million people each day don't show up for work because of stress. Managers can better cope with their own stress and establish ways for the organization to help employees cope if they understand the conditions that tend to produce work stress. In terms of more typical everyday work stressors, one approach is to think about the stress caused by the demands of job tasks and stress caused by interpersonal pressures and conflicts, task demands, and interpersonal demands. 
Task demands are stressors arising from the tasks required of a person holding a particular job. Some kinds of decisions are inherently stressful. Those made under time pressure that have serious consequences or are made with incomplete information. Jobs in which people have to deal with irate customers can also be highly stressful. Almost all jobs, especially those of managers, have some level of stress associated with task demands. Task demands also sometimes cause stress because of role ambiguity, which means that people are unclear about task behaviors that are expected of them. In a survey from the American Psychological Association, 35% of respondents cited unclear job expectations as a cause of their workplace stress. Interpersonal demands are stressors associated with relationships in the organization. Although interpersonal relationships can alleviate stress, in some cases, there also can be a source of stress when a group puts pressure on an individual or when conflicts arise between individuals. Role conflict occurs when an individual perceives incompatible demands from others. Managers often feel role conflict because the demands of their supervisors conflict with those of their employees in the department. They may be expected to support employees and provide them with opportunities to experiment and be creative, while at the same time top executives are demanding a consistent level of output that leaves little time for creativity and experimentation. Organizations that want to challenge their employees to stay competitive will never be stress-free, but healthy workplaces promote the physical and emotional well-beings of their employees. The first tactic is prevention. Seek and destroy the key sources of stress. A recent study found that the most beneficial stress management competency is prevention. None of us can eliminate all potential sources of stress in our lives, but we can avoid some of them and manage others. You can also find meaning and support. You are much more likely to experience ill effects of stress if you're working in a job that has no meaning for you and if you feel left alone. The buffering hypothesis says that a perceived high degree of social support from family and friends protects one from the potentially adverse effects of stressful events. Finally, find work-life balance. One study found that a lack of work-life balance was the number one predictor of high levels of unhealthy stress. Managers should always remember that employees are human resources with human needs. By acknowledging the personal aspect of employees' lives, these various initiatives communicate that managers and the organization care about employees. In addition, managers' attitudes make a tremendous difference in whether employees are stressed out and unhappy or relaxed, energetic, and productive.